say mycobacteria because I'm Argentinian, so I will say mycobacteria. And I actually, um, I, I really um, realized at the end that it was the, the title of the presentation it should be Criteria for Defining Enviro Enviro Environmental Disease. And I put lung disease because I am a pneumologist and for the rest I leave the infectiologist and the rest of the colleagues here. But I'm very pleased to be here today with you and to share some of the challenge that we have with this difficult uh, disease of, of spectrum of diseases, as you will see. Um, environmental by mycobacteria, they're also found in the literature, as you already heard, like many, many other names, like non-tuberculous mycobacteria, atypical mycobacteria, mycobacteria other than mud, or just a little cousins of TB, which are actually ubiquitous. Ubiqui ubiquitous, it's a very different, uh, difficult uh, um, word, but that means that it's actually in the environment, sort of everywhere. Probably here there's a lot of uh, environmental mycobacteria, in particularly in the garden, in the water, as uh, Professor Bolt could say before. And um, they are opportunistic, and like M. tuberculosis, they need they re uh, a defect in the local or systemic host immunity in order to cause disease in human beings. So they actually will need a problem in the lung, a structural lung damage, and we will go for, for all these kind of pathologies associated with non-tuberculous mycobacteria. I, I took this, this nice uh, paper of um, Christopher Bland in 2005 that very nicely represent um, the um, ecology of mycobacterium tuberculosis in uh, the Rio Grande, which is a river that has almost 3,000 kilometers, and it's between the border of uh, United States of America and Mexico, and there's a lot of population around there, like two million people living around. And they could find in, in one year long uh, that more than 20 species were different, and it were different uh, between different kind of um, uh, um, weathers and in different kind of conditions and different kind of amounts. Of, uh, it was all the time changing. So, as it has been said, we are um, we have a lot of mycobacteria there, and especially and particularly in water, even in fresh water, in rivers, um, in uh, shower heads, in treated water, in hot water, cold water, uh, nebulizers, bronchoscopes, hot tubs. Uh, our ha habits and uh, have changed, and we travel a lot. We scuba dive. We go to here and there, and we we use showers every day. Whereas before, you used to to have um, uh, uh, I would I don't know how to say veins or just uh, you know to go into the in the yeah different different kind of but hot tubs uh, essentially has been uh, recently uh, in the latest in the latest uh, 50 years in um, change uh, uh, the habitude of every every everyday living the I we already discussed a little bit about person to person transmission and i i i would say that they it doesn't exist although this is a paradigm that probably is going to be changed in the future years that that's what i was interested to know the opinion of uh, Professor Bodker about this, because as a cystic fibrosis, uh, cystic fibrosis um, doctor, uh, I am um, worried about this, and I, I will show you later some of the patients that we're following and are actually causing us a lot of trouble. So, uh, ex the exception, the caveats being said about uh, CF patients in CF clinics no, in Seattle uh, that report uh, a pseudo outbreak or an outbreak, I don't know how to call it, and uh, probably a pseudo outbreak or an, a real outbreak in, pa in the Papworth clinic. This is uh, attending for clarification, and a lot of research is going on. And I hope in the future update guidelines we will know in 2016 more about uh, this. So, um, Dr. Bagner already uh, showed this very nice snapshot about EM in, in Europe. He's this uh, doc uh, doctor from Holland is part of the e e uh, NMT group. And um, they show uh, actually MAC that was predominantly in uh, Europe and followed by Kansasi. And it's more, se more or less the same in the United States. Uh, uh, MAC is in on top and uh, followed by M. abscessus.
so as you can see, I think it's, it's interesting, as Professor Bok just said before, that it's interesting to see uh, who, uh, who are these guys. I'm, I mean, the we have to distinguish between the common and the less frequent mycobacteria. The common mycobacteria that can affect and can become lung pathogens are listed here. So as you can see, it's avium, intracellular, MAC complex, we call it, Kansasi, M. abscessus, which is actually called abscessus uh, sensu propro, or something like that, or <laughs> abscessus abscessus, sensu strictu sensu, so yeah. So abscessus boleti, formerly called M. macilensis. This one is the particular one that could be uh, in the transmission in CF people. And M. boleti, uh, awaiting taxonomy name, uh, that was my last update, but probably now he's called boleti. So it's more than 140 mycobacteria that are around us, and these less frequent mycobacteria like Sinopi, Zulgai, Malmoense, Fortuitum, um, sometimes can be a little bit of trouble, but most of them they're not, actually. Um, this one are never pathogen, less, I guess has been said, Gordonae doesn't worry us uh, at all, and this one sometimes they can become pathogens. Um, well, clinical symptoms, because we're clinical doctors, and we would have like chronic cough, people that um, will cough chronically, but of course they have other lung diseases, as you can see, as you're going to see later, purulent sputum, uh, hemoptysis that can be present. So when, when they're more, more ill, they, they can have a little bit of malaise, fatigue, weight loss with advanced disease. But uh, the American Thoracic Society defined these criteria, and I will say to retain pathology or lung pathology, it's more like a constellation, like uh, the stars in the ceiling. There's just not one thing. It's not, it's not about the bug, but it's about a, a whole constellation. So we must use these guidelines because as it has been shown before, these guidelines are there, but people are, are doing different things in different countries. And that's a pity because we do have good guidelines that probably need to not update, but they're good. And we must, we must think and go back to, to what the previous people observe and uh, explain very nicely. So the clinical guidelines must be pulmonary symptoms, uh, like I've said before, cough, sputum, malaise, but it must be a company with uh, CT scan patterns, like, uh, or uh, X-rays to sample. Um, nodular or cavitary opacities on chest radiographs, you're gonna see them later, or a high resolution CT scan that can show multifocal bronchiectasis, multiple small nodules, micronodules, and uh, we want at least two positive cultures put them taken within several weeks apart. Why do we want this? Because sometimes a patient can become transitory, uh, transitory infected and then he gets rid of the bug and then that doesn't cause us a problem. So that should be, I think, uh, preferably, if not one day and the next day again, but per probably several weeks apart. Or one bronchial lavage. As you know, we lung specialists, we like to, to perform our bronchoscopies to exclude other diseases like sarcoidosis, TB, of course, but also lung cancer. And these patients share multiple risk factors like COPD and tabagism. So most of them, uh, we are always scared about this lesion, excavated, because we cannot say this is mycobacteria. So we need to perform bronchoscopy and LBA. So sometimes we refer them to the surgeons because we suspect a lung cancer. And that's my colleagues here. There's a lot of pneumologists and, uh, and we all know that uh, sometimes the, the surgeon tells us, OK, this is, a, this is a granuloma. This is not a, we're happy about that, of course. And then we discover that the, the, the surgeon didn't send the, the, the sample to microbiology. And <laughs> we, <laughs> we are a little bit uh, complicated there, but we uh, very quickly asked the laboratory to do a PCR uh, urgently and uh, anyways. So a very important thing is that you, we must have in mind the differential diagnosis and not only infectiologists, but also the lung diseases that can affect in the same way uh, um, our patients. So in the infections, 
I will, uh, I will say, first of all, of course, MTB, but then uh, also fungi. Uh, endemic mycosis is a problem in America and South America. Um, parasites, well, probably in Africa, but we don't, we don't see much of those. And non-infectious diseases like sarcoidosis, chronic beryllium disease, uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, in which you're going to be some of, of these cases later. Uh, but also Wegener granulomatosis, you see the, these lesions can resemble very much for TB and NTB. And, uh, well, of course, they are accompanied with other symptoms like a vasculitis, insuffi uh, renal insufficiency. And, of course, our very, very uh, well-known sarcoidosis with a multiple um, sites of affection. So it's a, it's, it's a challenge, I, might say, I must say, for the lung specialist. So first of all, I would like to speak a little bit more about M. avium and the clinical presentation. Uh, I, I choose that, but it's not me. Many, many people choose to divide them in, in these different uh, kind of uh, risk factors groups. And you can see there's uh, the first of all is pre existing lung disease. Uh, second, no previous lung disease. We're going to see. Uh, which is uh, this kind of people. Uh, phenotypes, familial phenotypes is included in the same. Uh, the, the group number three, hot tab lung, as I say before, is uh, an, al an alveolite allergic extrinsec, uh, that's a uh, um, hypersensitive pneumonitis, or uh, I think in, in English there's a word also for that. HIV patients and immunosurprised patients normally, usually, pardon, uh, but very rarely thankful uh, children. And um, this is a big problem, anti-TNF blockers lately, and you will see the, the, the data there are quite worrisome. So predisposing lung diseases, which are they? Well, we know them, cystic fibrosis included adult onsen variants and CFTR-related lung disease, bronchiectasis, Previously not diagnosed with CF, and all of a sudden we realized that these guys, they have also a probably um, a problem, a digestive problem, and we perform a test, uh, a sweet test, and we discover that they have problems also, and we do a phenotypic um, geno geno genotype, and we, we find mutations. Um, Non-CF bronchiectasis, COPD, silicosis, gastroesophageal reflux uh, with aspiration and with or without symptoms, probably this is, this is a problem with the, the I, we, we still don't know why, but we, we see more prevalence in gastroesophageal reflux and mycobacterial, um, non-mycobacterial uh, tuberculosis uh, lung infections. Prior TB and scaring of the lung, upper, upper scares, of course, as well. HIV, immun and I say as I say before, immunosuppressive. Um, what about the, the presentations? They're mostly fibrocavitary disease with um, in pre-existing pre uh, lung disease with COPD, for instance, like you can see here, this is a COPD patient with very huge cavities here. Um, we can see also this in uh, post-radiation fibrosis in, in people that had, have extended radiation before when we used to, to, to use very high doses of radiotherapy, bronchiectasis, silicosis, and again, as I say, uh, CF. There's another pattern, which is nodular bronchiectachic MAC lung, and the radiographic features, as you can see here, you, might, you can see here a bronchiectasy accompanied with the <coughs> micronodules that follow a centrilobular pattern. And I put you this uh, because we are in the springtime and it's blossom, but also because it's the tree in bud lesions in the lungs that we lung specialists recognize very well. And it's very characteristic, I wouldn't say pathognomonic, but characteristic of NT NTM and, and tuberculosis as well. Again, uh, this is a patient uh, follow at the shoe with bronchiectasis and um, as you see here, micronodules. Um, this was an uh, avian bronchiectasis in a patient, postmenopausal woman, 55 years of age. Uh, and uh, about this, I'm going to come to this old-fashioned term that I would say I will abandon it. I wouldn't think about this girl, about this lady. Uh, the term Lady Windermere uh, syndrome was uh, d used to describe an old uh, a woman that wouldn't spit because Victorian woman, uh, say my grand, my mother-in-law, she wouldn't. Uh, cough or spit, of course, and uh, they, it wasn't a hypothesis that this woman uh, will voluntarily retain sputum and this will cause disease infected to mouth. And this will happen in the right lobe 
uh, of the lung, or in the left lobe, the, lef uh, the, the lingula and the right lobe. As I think this is an old-fashioned term. I prefer more this kind of uh, data, which comes from uh, Kim and has been published in the Blue Journal. And as you can see, apparently, this is part of the group number two, the people who have not been previously ill from the lungs, they're not COPD, they're not CF, they, ha they don't have bronchiectasis, but they apparently they are taller than average, they're more slender than average, they, they have higher prevalence of scoliosis, like 51%, higher prevalence of pectum excavatum, and higher prevalence of mitral valve prolapse. These are postmenopausal women, and interesting. Another, another interesting finding in this group is that 36% of this population would have or we could have found de novo CFTR mutation. These are not Lady Windermere because the majority does chronically cough and she didn't cough. And the, uh, interestingly, we didn't found any uh, recognized immune defects when uh, Kim and co-workers investigated that. There's another nice paper that shows here that um, when they found people having M avian complex, and this was mostly women from white race uh, in uh, European countries probably, and these people, uh, when we go and see their relatives, their first uh, relatives or second relatives, we would find more features, more traits, in the, in the, sa the same kind of traits that we would find in this person. And this would be uh, also scoliosis, also um, pectum excavatum. Sometimes we would find uh, PN, uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria in them, and mitral valve prolapse. So there might be something there. Uh, now, what, what about mycobacterium respiratory infection and how does the lung affected by mycobacteria? As you can see here, there's a very important progression of the granuloma inside the terminal bronchial, and in there's a, 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 a huge amount of granuloma formation that will destruct the architecture of the bronchial, and will produce necrosis and cavity, and will actually distort completely the anatomy. And as you can see here, the bronchial will lose his cartilage in the, in the previous you know, uh, airway, not in the distal because we don't have any cartilage, but before they will lose uh, the cartilage and completely lose the small, um, small layer and uh, the bronchi will dilate and then that's mechanism of formation of bronchiectasis. So when they say egg or a chicken, chicken or egg, I don't know, probably there's both, but it's certainly for sure that Mac is doing very, 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 a lot of damage in the lung of our patients. The third group is MAC hot tub lung. And as again, we all like to go and do uh, uh, these kind of things and go, I don't know, to spas and et cetera, et cetera. And, but some of them, they're not clean. And even them, if they're clean, the, m the mycobacteria, they like the, the thing that we, we, we put inside the filters to clean it because they eat all kinds of these bugs and they become robust. So they, they survive. So these patients will present to the emergency room with acute onset of dyspnea, uh, shortness of breath uh, for, the, for the nurses to understand dyspnea, and myalgias, fever, and very bad actually. And this is a woman that we've seen where probably you cannot see here very well, but I wanted to show here uh, a sort of a different kind of pattern. Uh, it's a diffuse interstitial lung disease with grand glass opacities. And we perform a bronchalveolar lavage, and we found la uh, 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 bald lymphocytosis, like 70%. The diagnosis was hypersensitive pneumonitis. Uh, there you are, extrinsic, extrinsic allergic alveolitis. It's also called like this in French, that's why. So the treatment for this patient was avoidance to re-exposure and steroids and antimicrobacterial. It's very contested. We don't need to treat them. but. We'll discuss later with uh, Claire, probably. This is a nice paper uh, about core and uh, co-workers. As you can see, 10 patients uh, went to an emergency room with chest pain, hypoxemia, and, well, uh, there's different kind of uh, ways to treatment. The fourth group is the HIV, people living with HIV and AIDS. As it has been said, these people perform more disseminated kind of disease with low CD4, uh, usually more than less than 50 uh, CD4. Um, the lung is very rarely um, affected as a, as a first in the first place. He's not the protagonist. The, these people is really uh, very, very ill. 
but lately with the introduction of um, a very highly effective antiretroviral therapy, uh, the, the incidence of uh, MAC in HIV uh, patients have very, very, um, has increased uh, very importantly. Um, the, the fifth group is these children that were in the Malta uh, 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 island, I think, and uh, these children were completely lacking of, uh, in of immunity and they have an absence of interferon gamma translates and an absence of regulation of TNF-alpha. And these children will develop very severe forms of mycobacterium avium disseminated with actually three or four children died in this uh, paper, like it has been shown, unfortunately. And the last one that I wanted to um, address is this emerging uh, uh, problem, I would say, uh, that we are all seeing lung specialists because since, uh, you can see, since year uh, 2000, the new biological treatments, the anti-TNF, therapy uh, has been uh, causing us not pro not only problems with TB but also with NTM. As you can see the Food and Drug Administration database uh, show an increased amount of diagnosis of Mycobacterium avium and others, with uh, particularly with infliximab but also adalimumab and etanercept, as you can see here. Most nicely here, the same group uh, uh, the same group in North America, in California, they show like 8,418 rheumatoid pa arthritis patients in America. And as you can see, this, 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 these drugs can really increase very, very, I was surprised when I, I read it twice because I couldn't believe the, uh, the rates. I mean, it's a TANESEP goes from 35 and, and it, it, it really competes against TB and TB, it's nothing to do there. Infliximab and other Minimumab. You can see uh, very, very um, high rates of uh, NTM in patients using embryo, Remy, K, Remsin, Inflector, Umira. I put them there because sometimes we, we are mixed up and we don't know uh, which one is w that's what. But be careful with those. Uh, that's the same. And I, I was curious about Rituximab and I found two, um, two case reports of Rituximab and Refractory um, in, in refractory myositis, but these patients were profoundly immunosuppressed and they develop um, bilateral pleural diffusions with M. avian and another one with Kansasi and cutaneous abscesses and osteomyelitis. Last but not least, uh, environmental mycobacteria in CF patients. This very nice uh, paper of Oliver changed the prevalence in the CF population, 30% of the CF population uh, has been published. It was a very nice multicenter study with 21 centers in the United States. So you can see my, my mycobacteria uh, avium is the first, abscess is second. And why cystic fibrosis patient develops or acquires MEM? Because first of all, you know that they have a very, very damaged epithelium and disruptive muc mucociliary clearance, they cannot get rid of their mucus plaques and they have a very severe stru structural lung damage. And I say before that all these were risk factors. Besides, they do have more tendency to have gastroesophageal reflux because they cause so much and they do so much physiotherapy that sometimes they are, um, I mean, they, they, all of them they have. And uh, besides, they do have co-infection with Aspergillus. And Aspergillus has a particularly in CF patient and asthmatic patients to develop uh, bronco, uh, aspergillosis bronchopulmonary allergic, uh, ABPA. And we have to treat them with uh, steroids. And that's not a nice combination. And well, this I will, I will expect that maybe Professor Botger can do a comment at the end because I've I found this paper of about this smooth variant and Roth variant that this uh, mycobacteria loses a uh, uh, parietal glycopeptide and sort of in a patient that has been colonized for a long time with an abscessus, all of a sudden this abscessus wakes up and he's evil and now he starts doing damage to our patients and it's probably the ability to trans to transition between the smooth and rag colony phenotypes that could have a particular relevance to M. abscessus pulmonary infection in cystic fibrosis patient. And I would like to show this um, 
this x-ray of a patient that we share with some of the patients that are here, uh, the, pa the colleagues that are working here today. This was a patient that uh, has been following the Canton de Jura for uh, cystic fibrosis and uh, she was having a uh, hemoptysis, uh, minor hemoptysis and she needed to be treated for a BPA before and she was on a very, a very low doses of, uh, of prednisone and she, we developed, we isolated M abscessus and aspergillus and you can see here she has both, he, she has a, a fungus ball and mycobacterium abscessus bronchiectasis in a CF patient. Well, we, we fight against these patients, we treat her we, we treat her, and now she's like this. What have we done? What have we done? We treat her aggressively, but we transplant her. And now she's doing fine. After three years, she's free of disease. She doesn't have any more um, abscessus. But at the, at the we, we took very good care of um, the surgery. The surgeons were very well trained, and they actually avoid uh, affecting the, the trachea and the carina and avoiding this, the anastomosis. You know, uh, they're, they're very careful about those an anastomosis. They don't want to, you know, to lager. So they, we took care. We tried to avoid the infection of the mediastinum and she's fine. But it was a big, 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 big uh, challenge. M. Sinopi, this is a very interesting patient. COPD, as you can see here, the emphysema and of had bronchiectasis uh, with emphysema. And I have very nice pictures here because he had both. He has also asbestos plaques, as you can see here. Probably you can see them diaphragmatic here, the asbestos. Um, he has an exposure of asbestos very nicely shown here. You can see here the emphysema, the emcenopi infection, the, abs, uh, the plaques. And again, here in a tridimensional way, here the kist and the plaques, asbestos, emphysema, and the M. Senopi infection. So very, very, um, uh, Senopi goes to COPD patients with easily with asbestos and silicosis as well as Kansasi, but Kansasi makes more, more cavities and more caverns. Um, this is again another patient uh, with COPD. So I will conclude now and I will, I will give you my recipe here of EM diagnosis um, and we will discuss later if we, how we treat them and when we treat them. Yeah, think about the clinical history, Hing, think about all you know, you lung specialist, previous lung disease, COPD, silicosis, post-TB, CF, think about it because sometimes we can diagnose CFTR because there's a marker of disease, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, as, as TB was for HIV. Pro I, I'm exaggerating, but probably think about it. Bronchiectasis, family traits, think about this postmenopausal woman bro bronchiectasis, pectum excavatum, etc. Anti TNF medication, radiological findings, microbiological, uh, the differential diagnosis. And the secret of this is to have a little bit of common sense and not, don't hesitate to discuss between lung specialists and microbiologists and uh, infectiologists because it's the only way to treat these bugs. And thank you very much.